Okay, thank you. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this uh, very stimulating workshop. I will be talking about a paper that appeared a few months ago with uh, Vijay Barasomamanyan, Bartek Cech and Gabor Sharoshi. Um, and I will first give you the very quick version and I'll, I'll go through it uh, more slowly. So the strongly coupled D1-D5 CFT is a microscopic model for black holes in string theory. And this model is expected to have chaotic dynamics. We will study instead it's the integrable limits of this model, where it's weakly coupled. And in that limit, we know precisely the operators that create microstates of the lightest black holes in the theory. In those microstates, we will compute uh, two-point functions of light probes, uh, normalized in a certain way, which I'll mention later. And uh, it was known already that those two-point functions exhibit some universal early time decay, followed by sporadic behavior at late times. And that's what we would like to understand. So in order to understand that late time sporadic behavior, we will propose some uh, time averaging to be applied to these two-point functions. And to first test that method, we will apply it to random matrix theory. And we will show that the progressive time average that we will use actually smooths um, what is known as a spectral form factor in that model, um, giving essentially the same result as the ensemble average that people usually use. So this progressive time averaging can be used also on systems which do not have an ensemble to average over, so we will use it for the system of interest. And if we do that, we will find that this early time decay will be followed by a dip, then an increase, which is called a ramp, and then a plateau. And this structure is in remarkable qualitative agreement with a recent discussion of the SYK model, but we will also comment on significant quantitative differences and similarities between these models. So that's, that was a short version. Let me now go through it uh, a bit more slowly. So the fact that black holes and chaos are discussed in the same talk is, uh, is no accident. Black holes have been known to be thermal objects for a long time, and it's also been known for a long time that what underlies um, thermal behavior is, uh, is chaos. So there's several manifestations of uh, this, this chaos. Um, one is that it governs the relaxation to thermal equilibrium when you perturb a system. And a second aspect of chaos is that there is strong sensitivity to initial conditions. So in classical models, the sensitivity is typically captured by Lyapunov exponents. Here's a simple example where you can imagine Q to be the position of some particle uh, and the dependence of a position at some later time on the position on earlier time is given by these Poisson brackets and this typically diverges exponentially where lambda is the Lyapunov exponent. Now in quantum mechanics it's more complicated to discuss chaos. I mean the most naive notion could be that you consider states similar if they have a large in product. But the problem is that the in product of two states is preserved under unitary time evolution, so it will never change. That will not give an analog of this classical notion of chaos we have here. A better notion is available in a semi-classical uh, approximation, where you can consider states to be similar if they discuss, for instance, two blobs in phase space which are close to each other, even though they don't significantly overlap. Um, and to quantify that, you replace these Poisson brackets by uh, a commutator, and um, you consider, for instance, the following observable, uh, where you take such a commutator, so I generalized uh, Q and P to some more general operators, um, and then uh, I multiplied by the Hermitian conjugate to get rid of the phases, 
And it turns out that this is an interesting object to study in this uh, context. So where does this come from other than from this analogy? Well, this operator W of t uh, you can view as describing the growth or the spreading of an operator. Consider, for instance, some uh, chain of quantum spins and consider double, uh, V and W at some time zero as um, acting on uh, two different spins, so they will commute with each other initially. Then as W is evolved with this Hamiltonian, um, in a chaotic system you will find that its support will spread, uh, it will become a product of uh, sigma matrices acting on many spins at the same time, and at some point the operator at this other location will start feeling it, and in a chaotic system this will grow exponentially. So this is what uh, one typically finds, and uh, well, my presentation here is based on a paper by Polchinski from a few years ago. You typically find that this function f of t, so this commutator squared, um, grows exponentially for some time, and then at a later time it will saturate, just like in thermal equilibrium, if you perturb the system it will eventually reach thermal equilibrium again. Um, in <coughs> the context of ADS-CFT, where thermal systems are related often to, to black holes, these uh, exponential growth and saturation have, uh, have counterparts. So first of all, this exponential saturation, which uh, is governed by what is known as Ruel resonances or uh, poles of retarded two-point functions, uh, those correspond to the well-known quasi-normal modes of black holes, which describe how a black hole will relax when you perturb it, and which, well, as I'm sure everybody knows here, um, have been found in uh, the recent gravitational wave measurements. The initial transient growth, uh, which is um, the analog of the Lyapunov growth uh, I discussed before, that's dual to another exponential that appears in black hole physics, namely if tau is the proper time of some infalling objects and t is the short shell time corresponding to it, then those are related by an exponential factor like this where beta is the inverse Hawking temperature. And well, in the recent last few years, there's this precise correspondence that the Lyapunov exponents in systems dual to black holes precisely correspond to uh, the essentially two pi times the temperature of the black hole. So roughly what's the time scale for it to get to this saturation point? Well, that will depend on the details of, of the system. So for instance, if you have uh, a very large system, you can imagine starting to perturb it at some position. And then this, uh, if you have local interactions, these perturbations will spread ballistically. And well, the bigger your system is, the longer you will have to wait until the operators cover the whole system. I mean, is it a, if for black holes, is it believed to be an order of the scrambling time or some, or, or some much longer time? Um, well, the, so, so typically the scrambling, or let's say, um, I think it's, it's related to, to a scrambling time. So, so typically if you have some, uh, so, so for instance, suppose you have some system of, of matrices uh, as you would have in uh, many ADS-CFT models, then you would have fast scrambling within the matrix degrees of freedom and then you would have ballistic spreading uh, because of the local interactions in space. Um, and there it depends on, on how big the space is until that saturates. Okay, so it's been, uh, conjectured that this um, Lyapunov exponent that you find in black holes in Einstein gravity is some universal upper bound you can have, that's a so-called chaos bound, which is uh, therefore saturated by black holes. And in fact, the lore has become that whenever you see a system that saturates the chaos bound, you think, aha, this system may be dual to, to black holes, and that's uh, in part how the, interest, the recent interest in the SYK model emerged, but I'll mention that later. Now the main focus on, on this talk will not be on the Lyapunov uh, growth, but it will be 
on this uh, Ruel saturation, um, which you also find in two-point functions. So I took a four-point function here because that's the smallest object that exhibits this Lyapunov growth. But this saturation you would also have in two-point functions, so I will actually focus on two-point functions in the remainder of, of this talk. Um, but the thing I'll be interested in is that this saturation is not quite true, as already uh, was mentioned yesterday in the um, introductory talks, um, because quantum mechanically, uh, if you have some system with discrete energy levels, this uh, decay cannot continue indefinitely. And there's several probes that have been proposed to study this, uh, this lack of monotonous decay. Um, so the first is a uh, two-point function. So here I take uh, expectation of a two-point function in some thermal state. And if you expand it in some energy basis, you get the following structure. And at sufficiently early times, you can, um, you can coarse grain over these energy levels. Their discreteness will not matter. And if you do that, you find a monotonous uh, decay, which is often exponential. So that's the quasi-normal mode uh, decay that I referred to before. If you look at late times, however, then these various phases will be sort of independent. So you will have uh, some sum over lots of random phases, and this will give rise to erratic oscillations. And this happens for this uh, thermal two-point function I wrote down here. It would also happen for two-point functions in pure states. It would be extremely similar. Uh, these phase factors would still be the same, and those are what governs these uh, erratic fluctuations. It's just what multiplies them that would be different depending on what state you, you work in. But really the important thing here is the energy spectra, not the precise uh, state you choose. <coughs> so a somewhat simpler diagnostic than a two-point function uh, has also been studied in, in this uh, context. So it's called the spectral form factor. And the idea is that you start with the partition function and then you analytically continue the inverse temperature and you introduce some, uh, some real time, so to say. And if you look at this object and you expand it, you get again a structure with these uh, phase factors. Um, and well, you can study this object as a function of time. So why is it, why is it useful? Well, first of all, it's somewhat simpler than, than two-point functions. Also, you can study it in theories where you're only given a Hamiltonian and you're not given operators, because this is a completely generic, uh, quite primitive, quantity, it only depends on the energy levels, not on any choice of operators uh, or states you want, might want to make. So let's look at this quantity and let's lo first look at what happens at, uh, at long times. So I told you already it will have these erratic oscillations, but these oscillations will be around some average, some long time average value, which you can easily compute. So if you take this uh, average over an infinite interval, then clearly the contributions where these phases are non-trivial will uh, average out, uh, and you will only get contributions from degenerate energy levels. So here I summed over the energies, and E is the degeneracy of the energy level E. So for instance, in a situation where there are no degeneracies, all the NEs uh, are one, this long time average is just a partition function with twice the inverse <coughs> temperature. And you can easily check, for instance, in the examples of, uh, of CFTs, that this uh, long time average is much smaller than the initial value at time equals zero of this quantity. So I gave here the result for a CFT, and you see that it's uh, suppressed by some exponential of the entropy of the system. So at late times, there's erratic fluctuations around some tiny value, typically. So this spectral form factor was recently studied in the context of the SYK model. So it's been, well, 
introduced in much more detail already, let, so let me be very brief. SYK is a quantum mechanical model with this Hamiltonian, the size are n Majorana fermions. The couplings j are independently drawn from some Gaussian distribution with some width that is set by uh, some coupling j here. Um, the Hilbert space of this, the dimension of the Hilbert space is 2 to the power n over 2, so it's exponential in this uh, number of Majorana fermions. And uh, I guess Kitayov noticed that this SYK model saturates the chaos bound, which motivates one to view it as a model for, uh, for black holes. So if you compute the spectral form factor, you get a red line uh, like this. So it starts at the initial value, then it decays. So this would be the analog of the quasi-normal mode decay. But then this doesn't continue forever. At some point, these erratic oscillations kick in. And uh, uh, well, one remarkable thing here is that the late time average um, is higher than the values that are typically reached at some earlier time. <coughs> so to study that more quantitatively, um, it's, uh, it's convenient to average over the ensemble. So you average over all the possible uh, draws of this coupling you, you could get. And when you, do, when you do that, you get this uh, solid line here. And that's clearly a curve one can, one can analyze. And what one sees is that this initial slope ends at a dip after which there is a ramp and there's a saturation at this plateau, at the level of ensemble averaged uh, quantities. But can you see those without ensemble averaging also? Can you see these features without ensemble averaging? I mean, from the red curve, it looks like there's a nice deep round plateau. Is it general? Well, that, depen that depends on, uh, on the details, like for some parameters. Like in this case, I guess you could argue, that if you know, well, in this case, you could argue, you could see it, I guess. Uh, there might be other cases where it's more difficult to see, but in any case, if you want to study it more quantitatively, it's clearly useful to, to extract from this some um, smooth curve that you can then uh, try to quantify. Do you average uh, z or log z? Uh, it's um, not a quench, but the annealed disorder. So they, well, so these authors took the, the simplest prescription. Um, also, they, I think they averaged like numerators and denominators independently. <coughs> but then they claimed in the numerical computations they did, if you took some other prescription, it would give essentially the same result. Um, so I don't think it's crucial for, for anything that will be said here. OK, so well, the motivation of these authors was that um, well, by understanding these uh, deviations from the quasi-normal mode decay, um, one can hopefully learn something about quantum gravity. So if one understands the bulk jewel of uh, this kind of behavior, it would tell us about the way uh, gravity breaks down non-perturbatively. So what they focused on was the similarities with random matrix behavior. So let me... Uh, briefly review some relevant aspects uh, here about uh, random matrix theory before applying it to this SY, uh, SYK context. So a central conjecture uh, in this context is that if you take a quantum chaotic system, which you can think of as a quantum system with a classical limit that is chaotic, then the spectral statistics of this system uh, will be described by random matrix theory, by which I mean more specifically uh, the Gaussian ensembles, uh, which go by uh, general um, Gaussian unitary, Gaussian orthogonal, Gaussian symplectic. Uh, so I gave one example of a partition function in, in, in one of these. Um, so when one studies these systems with given energy spectra, which may be random or may be uh, not random, depending on, on the context. <coughs> the first step is to define some mean eigenvalue density. So if you have 
some disordered system with ensemble averages that's straightforward to define. You just um, look at a certain position in energy space and you take the average <laughs> over, all the, over all the couplings in your ensemble and that will be your mean density there. Um, if you have only a single Hamiltonian without disorder to average over, what you do is coarse graining. So you um, look at a certain position in energy space and you take you, um, an average density uh, in, in a certain interval around it and that will give you the average. Um, and then the statistics of uh, eigenvalue that is relevant here is um, strictly speaking one means the statistics of the unfolded spectrum and by that one means that one um, changes the well rescales the spectrum so that the average value is is everywhere the same is everywhere one and then relative to that you can look at the position of individual energy eigenvalues and what their statistical properties are. For instance, one extreme case would be that they're all equally spaced. Another extreme case would be that they looked as if they were randomly inserted. And that, that would, of course, be a completely different picture. So two important properties are, first, level repulsion. So well, as we know from quantum mechanical perturbation theory, energy levels tend to repel each other. And this is an effect that is important uh, at short distances in energy, sp in energy space. So it tells you that in a chaotic system you're unlikely to find two energy levels that are very close to each other. Um, a second aspect is uh, spectral rigidity. And um, that describes repulsion between energy levels at bigger distances in, in energy than just neighboring energy levels. And for instance, what spectral rigidity tells you is that in uh, quantum chaotic systems, typically the actual number of levels in a certain interval will be very close to the average number of levels in an interval of that size, uh, which, would be, which would not be the case if these energy levels were randomly inserted. So some intuition, why is this level rep repulsion? Why does one expect it to be important in chaotic system and systems and uh, not in integrable systems, for instance. Well, in integrable systems, if you look at the phase space distribution of solutions, uh, well, the solutions will be on invariant tori, so you could expect that different solutions will be on different invariant tori, and they will not really overlap in phase space, so that they, don't, they won't feel each other, so to say. Whereas in chaotic systems, because the solutions will uh, explore the whole phase space, they will be sensitive to the fact that there's other solutions, they will feel each other and therefore they will repel each other. So that's the intuition uh, behind these uh, properties of random matrices and therefore of uh, quantum chaotic systems. So we had the spectral form factor numerically for SYK, so let's see what it looks like for random matrix theory. In blue, I um, plotted the spectral form factor for a single realization of a random matrix. And okay, you, you recognize uh, the structure from the SYK um, uh, plots I showed before. And again, we can average over the random matrices to get some smooth curve, which has the same structure of a slope, a dip, a ramp, and a plateau. Now, in random matrix theory, you can look more closely where the various features come from. Uh, well, first of all, the fact that um, for different realizations, you will have the same initial decay. Um, that's, that's called self-averaging. So this initial slope is self-averaging. It will not depend on the specific realization. Um, and the details of this uh, slope turn out to be determined by the mean energy density uh, I mentioned before. So this mean energy density is not meant to be universal across quantum chaotic systems, so that will be specific for uh, any given system. But then the other features, particularly this ramp and this plateau, they are determined by the fluctuations 
uh, around this mean energy density, so by the spectral statistics of energy eigenvalues. If you look at the very late times, uh, well, it's clear that um, there you will only be sensitive to the smallest energy differences because the others uh, have already averaged out by that time. So clearly for very late times it's important what neighboring energy values, uh, energy eigenvalues do. So this will be determined by the level repulsion properties. The ramp here is determined by the, the property of spectral rigidity, so that's sensitive to what happens at bigger distances in uh, the space of energy eigenvalues. The question is at Heisenberg time, is it around uh, 7 where you have this change of the two curves? Um, so, uh, the change from the second to third by the supposed mm -hmm. to be the Heisenberg? That time level yeah, I don't know exactly where uh, where it should be, but yeah, it should roughly. Okay, does anyone know what uh, Heisenberg time would be in this context? Um, Generally, it depends on energy because you have stuff states uh, very less energy of excitation as a y k model. Yeah, so so this this time uh, is um, is exponential in the entropy, which I guess is uh, is probably the Heisenberg time, right? Uh, it's inverse should be proportional to the matrix dimension. Right. So which is full, which would be yeah. So so this time will be set by the inverse of the smallest energy difference. So if the total range of energies is some fixed number, then you have exponential s of uh, of those. So this uh, yeah. So I. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. What about the position of the deep? Uh, yeah. So this uh, this one can one, one can analyze. Um, I mean, is is it going to be exponential in the entropy in time, or could we? Yeah. That there's okay. The this will be exponential of the entropy. I think this will be. Uh, okay. I don't remember for how long, is the, how long is the ramp? Well, it's parametrically long. So that's important, and it will be it will be exponential in the entropy. So this uh, this will go like exponential s, and this will be, I think it was uh, exponential of some smaller power, of, of, of with a smaller coefficient. But they're they're both exponentially long. Um, so, so there is a parametrically long ramp here. I don't remember the precise uh, coefficients I in exponent. Suppose uh, in mesoscopic physics people s uh, speak of solar energy. Or this inverse so, so when the system becomes classically ergodic and the random matrix level statistics, that means also the region of spectral energy is valid up to times, uh, up to energy scales to the solar energy. Okay. Or for time scales beyond this time. But for random matrix, it should be a short time because uh, you are immediately chaotic. But if you take, uh, say, a band matrix model or disordered system, then you might have uh, short times where it's regular and you have to wait longer times, then it might change. I think this might be dependent on the model and uh, for the SYK model, then you may have a difference between these, uh, it may be a bit different because uh, there's more sparse, the SYK model compared to random matrix. Yeah, so, okay, in the numerical computations people have done for, for SYK and random matrices, uh, well, okay, I was going to com come back to it later, but the, the claim is that from here onwards uh, it looks identical, essentially. Then the details of the initial decay, they are somewhat different also, although it's difficult to see in the plots, uh, because that depends on, on the details. Uh, for instance, for uh, random matrix theory, this uh, mean uh, energy distribution is this Wigner semicircle, and then the, uh, the rate of decay at the beginning is set by these sharp edges. Uh, so if that is different in another model, it will be different initially. But what is supposed to be the universal part for quantum chaotic systems is uh, basically what happens from the dip onwards. And indeed, for that, people find uh, good agreement. Sorry. Um, you could also take the Hamiltonian and diagonalize it and look at distribution of eigenvalues directly, right? That's what uh, is behind these uh, numerical yeah. computations. Why is it more useful to consider the spectral form factor rather than ah. directly studying the distribution of eigenvalues? 
Uh, you can take this number variance, if it's also interesting, which you mentioned, where you uh, say the number fluctuations of numbers of level in interval. If you have uncorrelated levels grow the less <coughs> linearly, and in random matrix case like log n, and in complicated system, initially like log, up to some energy, soundless energy, and then somewhat different. And these growing somewhat different is what see the left size is uh, okay. specific of the system. If you imagine, take a bent matrix model, where you can have different regions, localization or diffusive behavior, you might tune this first energy scale with the parameters, I believe. Uh, that means it's a region where you have some, uh, you have for short time some diffusive dynamics and then it becomes ergodic and the diffusive dynamic would be the left part, I would suppose. Uh, so. So, so, yeah, so in, in, let me add that in, in the context of SYK, people have also, okay, I've, I've also looked at other things, namely, uh, well, not the spectral form factor, but uh, like the short distance properties, spectral properties of, of the system. I'll, I'll have it on the next slide. I, I think I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, but I think, well, one motivation to look at this is that it's a proxy for the two-point function. And this uh, two-point function, I presume, in, in other models is, uh, one may hope, is easier to compute than actually diagonalizing the the Hamiltonian, for instance, if you want to look at this D1, D5 system. Well, okay. <coughs> yeah, okay, so. So here is this, uh, well, some aspects of the com comparison. I will not go into, into the details, but just to try and give you a, a flavor of the kind of uh, tests people have done. Uh, so, well, I think this was this unfolded nearest neighbor level spacing I mentioned before. I think this was first studied in this first paper. Here, all the plot this is from the second paper. Uh, so here you can see what you expect uh, based on uh, random matrix theory. Um, so those are the two solid lines you see here. I gave two different ensembles because it turns out that the SYK model will correspond to uh, one of those three ensembles depending on the value of n mod 8. So they, all, they appear all three uh, and it has to do with uh, symmetries, uh, discrete symmetries of the model that depend on the precise value of, uh, of n. Um, and then so you can, you can test whether SYK is indeed well captured by random matrices and you can see that for a value where you expect agreement with GUE, uh, these dots lie exactly on the curve and similarly for uh, this value n equals 32 where you expect agreement with J or U. Uh, or U. So this works uh, beautifully. Similarly for the spectral form factor, um, there's also some subtle differences depending on, uh, on n mod 8. So, um, uh, this, so depending on which uh, of these three ensembles you expect to get. You expect to get either some smooth saturation or some sharp corner. I guess uh, this is one. Uh, or some kink here. And this again also matches uh, very precisely with what people find numerically in the SYK model. So there's a quite detailed agreement um, between uh, what people find numerically in SYK and what is expected based on uh, the random matrix behavior that is expected. There was also work, I think, earlier in numerical work of Fierbach and Garcia. Ah, okay, yes, I, yes, thank you. By SYK, you always mean Q equal 4? Four, four uh, yes, yeah, that's a specific. Have anybody tried to change that? Uh, I'm not sure in this kind of computations. I don't know if anyone else knows. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of other values of Q that's for which this computation has been done. If you take, for example, Q equals 6, then you will reduce the sparsity of them. Then you will become much stronger, closer to uh, full random matrix. No? Uh, that means the uh, larger the Q, the stronger, the closer still to. I, I had the opposite feeling that Q equals 2 would look like a random matrix model. No, no, no. Q, equal, Q equals no, 4. Q equals 4 is the case which is, le uh, say, 
uh, non-trivial non -trivia in the sense the matrix is sparse because you have many zero elements. If you have Q equals 6 at fixed uh, size of the Hilbert space, you have uh, less zero elements and has, have more independent random numbers and you are much closer. Probably you have the same statistics, but uh, scale mm -hmm. up to which, uh, for large energies, up to which random matrix uh, series valid will become larger. Uh, okay. Probably. Yeah, but okay, I'm, I'm not really an, an expert. I mean, my expectation from what I've seen here is that, uh, well, since these various SYK models are supposed to be maximally chaotic, uh, I would expect that from the time where the behavior starts being determined by the spectral statistics, that from that time onward it should agree with, uh, with whatever random matrix ensemble is relevant for, for it. So after the dip, where exactly the dip will be, I mean, that will depend on, on details and on this initial decay, which, okay, I'm not sure is that easy to anticipate. Um, but okay, I... Okay, so now let's move to um, the main part of, uh, of the talk, which is uh, a string theory model for, for black holes. So the D1, D5 CFT, well, it's the same CFT in which uh, Strominger and Vafa did their counting of black hole microstage, which was also prominently present uh, in, uh, in Yossi's talk this morning. So I won't say too much about it. Uh, it's, uh, the CFT is a marginal deformation of a sigma model on uh, permutation, a symmetric orbifold. So here's uh, n powers of the four torus divided by the symmetric group. Um, if you choose not to deform this uh, um, sigma model, then you get the orbifold limit, which you can think of as a zero coupling uh, version of, of the model where it's integrable, so it's highly non-chaotic. The strongly deformed version is where the appropriate description is in terms of black holes in gravity, and there it is chaotic. Now, we're not strong enough to uh, access this, so we thought as a first step, let's study these uh, two-point functions in the model where we can easily compute uh, things and where actually the two-point function had been computed before uh, and, and see what we get uh, in, in this context. So we took the integrable <laughs> limits and we took the microstates of the lightest uh, black holes in the, in the theory. So those are the so-called Ramon-Ramon ground states. Um, and um, we took we studied two-point functions of uh, what we call graviton operators, so they represent small deformations of the volume of the T4, uh, for instance. And then we normalized this two-point function by the same two-point function in, in vacuum. And by vacuum here, I mean the vacuum in the NS uh, sector. Uh, that's to get rid of certain divergences that, that you get in this integrable model, like if you have perturbations that go around the circle, they will periodically meet each other. So to kill off those, we uh, normalize by the same two-point function in vacuum. So this object was actually computed um, more than 10 years ago, and uh, this is what people had found. Now, Yosef can, uh, can say whether you see some structure in this or not. Um, I guess it depends on... Uh, Anything is structured, so the black hole is just going on forever, so the fact that it's starting at all, that should be structured, the horizon. So yeah. Uh, anyway, so we, we found this curve in this, uh, in this paper. Um, okay, this is a model with a well-defined Hamiltonian, no disorder whatsoever, so what do you do with this? Uh, okay, you can stare at it. Um, and then the, the idea was to, well, what if we try to do some time average uh, instead of ensemble average? And okay, you can play around with it a bit, and then it turns out um, that the most promising thing would be to use a time window, but not a fixed one, but one that grows with time, uh, in proportion of the time. And well, I can already anticipate that this gives a nice smooth curve if you do this. But I can also imagine that you might think I'm cheating a little bit, or I'm not really motivating why I'm doing this. Uh, it's not like you're given some disordered system and you <coughs> average over disorder because that's what you do in, in systems like that. So to try and motivate the thing before I show you the, the result, um, I will test this proposal in the well-studied context of random matrix theory where people have been taking ensemble averages forever. 
trans you uh, average over the black hole microstates? That doesn't help. So if you take uh, an average, you will again find the same curve that looks uh, pretty much the same, except the details of this noise. Well, the, the oscillations will average up. No, no, they won't. Uh, no, because uh, that's essentially what I said at the beginning, I think. Uh, so this is, for example, an average in a thermal state. And you have the same sum with these random phases. So the only thing that is different is that you have these matrix elements uh, as opposed to things that uh, depend on the precise microstate. But these phases are still the same. So the details of this erratic behavior will be slightly different, but it will look the same to the naked eye. Uh, so that doesn't help. So you really, if you want to do ensemble average, you need a way to average over uh, different uh, spectra. But that we don't have because we have a well-defined Hamiltonian. So was this an exact calculation uh, of the two-point function, or was this an approximation uh, regarding the distribution of strings in the orbit field? Ah, uh, right. So this was uh, this was computed in a typical microstate of the in a typical Ramon Ramon ground state. Of the two charge system. Of the two charge system. It's yes. not the same as the typical of the three charge system. That's true. Yes. This has square root of n strings of square root of n lengths. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. So if you took a comp oops. Uh, okay. Uh, and in practice, this is done in some ensemble, the sexual calculation? No, just one state. Right, so it's, it's okay. So, yeah, so technically, to do it, you take uh, a typical microstate, but then uh, it's technically slightly easier to do this in some grand canonical ensemble. Um, but I don't, I, those are technical details. I don't think they will affect uh, what you see in the picture here. Yeah. Yes. So, what does play the role of the energy? I mean, now these, all these states have the same energy, right? They're all. Yes. So, but you were pointing out about the, the, to this the erratic phases e to the i. Ah. Uh, uh, so in this system is slightly different. Right? Yeah. So, okay. Do I have the formula here? Uh, well, okay. So you, if you compute this two-point function, I don't know if I have it more explicitly later on, but you you can again. Um, it will be the excitation spectra. That, that matter, because uh, if, if you look at a two-point function, you have to insert complete sets of states, and those are all the states. Uh, so in that way, all the energy differences, uh, or, or some of the energy differences in the spectrum will show up in this uh, two-point function. Um, I, I probably have some more formulas later. Anyway, let, let's first discuss it at, at this level. So, um, so here is the spectral form factor for a single realization of a random matrix. Um, and let's ask, instead of doing the ensemble average that people usually do, could we have done some time average uh, instead? So here's the first attempt. Take some, uh, well, here's four first attempts. Take some time window with, with 10, 60, 110, 160. And what you quickly find is that you're squeezed because if you, take the time average to be small, the, the time window to be small, then things go reasonably well at the beginning. Okay, reasonably well. But you fail to average out these late time oscillations. Uh, remember, that, observe that this is a logarithmic scale on the, on the plot. So you, you, don't do, you don't average things out here. If you take a very big time window, Okay, then you're doing a better job at these time averages here, but you're completely um, butchering this, uh, this deep structure over here. So you're squeezed uh, between wanting to capture the early times and, and the late times. So that's where this uh, idea of uh, progressive time averaging came in, where you say, okay, let me take a fixed time window, but in, this log in the logarithm of the time, not in the time itself. And if you do that, here's what you find. So this works beautifully, um, and it's. Uh, what, was the, what was the difference here? Here I take a fixed window delta t, and in the next one I will take delta t to be proportional to t. So in other words, it will be a fixed window on this logarithmic scale. Oops. Sorry, this is for the spectrum for a factor, not for the probability. That's true. Yes. So I'm. 
comparing spectral form factors of one with correlators for the other system. I, okay, one, but, but it doesn't really make a difference for this uh, kind of considerations. Do you understand analytically why this works? We have, some, we have some heuristic arguments, uh, but not an extremely precise one. So we convinced ourselves that there was some analytic reason to trust this, but then we, well... Because you know the variance in the spectrum and so on in the random matrix theory. Yes, so we, we okay, we, we have some... Suppress the leading uh, with a version somehow in this way. We have some argument at the level of the nearest neighbor uh, distance. So f for that, we have some analytic argument and uh, show that it sort of works uh, as, as you would expect. But I don't claim to have a solid, uh, solid understanding of that. I mean, we just convinced ourselves using that, but then the evidence we present is a numerical one. That's uh, where I think it's, it's quite convincing, at least at its level. So, so you see it basically indistinguishable from uh, the ensemble average in terms of how accurately you get a smooth curve. Okay, so with this encouragement from the test on random matrix theory, we, apply, we applied it to uh, this um, string theory, well, black holes in quotation marks, because again, we are not in the gravitational regime, we're in the regime where the system is weakly coupled in the, in the field theory. So if you do this uh, progressive time averaging, you find these uh, blue dots and there it's obvious that there is uh, this uh, structure of slope, deep ramp and plateau. Uh, okay, and we did it for various values and it's, uh, it works. So one lesson from this is that this deep and ramp structure, which is present in random matrix theory, and so, okay, at least the way I read uh, some of the earlier papers was that um, um, well, because of quantum chaos, you expect a, um, a structure like this. The implication does not go the other way around. So if you, if you don't have chaos, and we definitely don't in our integrable limit, you can still have this uh, structure of, uh, with a ramp and a, and a plateau. So that's, I think, the main lesson. Um, but also, because we are very far from being chaotic in the regime we work in, there must be important quantitative uh, differences. And indeed, if you look more closely, the plateau we find is much higher than it would have been in a chaotic regime and it forms much earlier than it would have done in a chaotic regime. And that's easy to understand. Let me come back to it a little bit later. So first, let me just mention that, uh, okay, this was all numerics, but we did uh, come up with some analytic approximations to the ramp and the, and the plateau. So here, I won't give you the details or even the formulas, just to give you some flavor. These dots are the numerical results, and then these step functions that we have are the analytic uh, rough approximations that, uh, that we came up with, and they match reasonably well. Um, and then, maybe more to our surprise, then we uh, added to this analytic approximation to the, to the ramp, we added the um, two-point function in the black hole, so the, just the semi-classical approximation. And then we added, we simply added the two results. So we added uh, what you get from the black hole to our analytic approximation to the ramp and the plateau. And when you add it, you get a green curve. And the dotted black curve is the result of our numerics and they're spot on. So, uh, so I think it's safe to say that the combination of the early time quasi-normal decay, so to say, and the analytic understanding we have of the uh, ramp and the plateau match the data very well. So, so your, your initial decay is exponential? In this case, it's not because we're at zero temperature. Oh. So it's power, it's power law here. The comment I was going to make is that there was this paper by Dyer and company. Yes. Where they were approximating the, the CFT partition function by different black hole saddle points, so yes. in the end they're getting some sort of polynomial decay. Yes. Can you comment on, of course, you're at zero temperature. Yeah, I think the zero temperature is the, is the difference. So they find different uh, time scales uh, than we do, but I think it's explained by, uh, by the fact that, that we are at zero temperature. Plus the zero temperature, there's no, there's no Euclidean. You, you don't have all these images, which Dyer has. So when you're at finite temperature, then you have all these images. And, you know, but mm -hmm. When you're at finite temperature, you have all these images, but at zero temperature, you don't have any of this. So. 
That is the only thing they have. So it's a good polynomial. Yes. Directly. Yes. So so then the deep time is what come from this? Uh, so. Yeah. So the. Deep time, I think it was square root of entropy, and the plateau time was entropy in our case. So it's again parametrically long, but remember that in the chaotic case, we were talking about exponentials of entropy, so it was much later. And also, the, similarly, the height of the, of the plateau is very different. It's much, it's much uh, bigger for us uh, than it would have been in, in chaotic cases. But that's fine, we understand why that's the case. And I'll come back to it uh, in a minute. Okay, so, so let me tell you a little bit more about this uh, CFT in order to comment on the, yeah, on the qualitative uh, differences, on the quantitative differences, sorry. So this D1-D5 CFT comes from the near horizon limit of type 2B strings on a compactive fight on a 5 torus, which are split into a circle and a 4 torus. I have some 1 brains and 5 brains wrapped in the way indicated. Um, so string theory on this near horizon geometry then corresponds to this orbifold uh, CFT. Um, and the, if you look at the states uh, of this orbifold CFT, they fall in different twisted sectors. And any twisted sector, well, you have n strands of string, and these strings can these strands of string can recombine in various ways. The only constraint is that the total number has to be n. So here I gave an example of uh, five strands. Uh, one short string and then two strings with length two. And um, the Ramon ground states are created by twist operators. The twist operators will indicate how the strands recombine. There's uh, order something types root of n, exponential root n of them. And they all have the same energy, but they have different excitation spectra. That will be important. So we studied the two-point function of a bosonic non-twist operator, that's also important, um, in a typical Ramon ground state. And um, such untwisted operators can only pick up contributions from, uh, they only have non-zero matrix elements if the long strings on both sides of them have the same length. Uh, that's because they don't contain twist operators, so they cannot change the length of a, of a long string. And that's why uh, you will only get contributions from energy differences uh, of the form m divided by n, where n is the length of, uh, of a long string. Now, if you were in a chaotic regime, all these degeneracies would be broken. The energy spacings would be exponentially small, as opposed to only suppressed by 1 over n here. And in that case, you therefore ha would have a much lower plateau, and it would be reached uh, much later. Okay, so let me first summarize uh, by repeating what I said at the beginning. So uh, in the strongly coupled D1-D5 CFT, we expect uh, black holes and chaos. We studied the zero coupling limit. We looked at two-point functions of untwisted operators, and we found this universal early decay followed by this uh, erratic late time behavior. We motivated progressive time averaging by showing that it works, seems to work very well in random matrix theory. We applied it to the system where we didn't have any ensemble average, uh, so we had to use some time average. And then we found this uh, uh, deep ramp and plateau structure. There's very good qualitative agreement with SYK and, and random matrices, but because our model is integrable rather than chaotic, there's also important uh, quantitative uh, differences. So let me end there. Thank you. Do you expect the chaotic structure to appear when you go to strong gravity or when you go away from externality? Because I can, I can go from your, from your place, I can increase gravity, so I can, I can go to the region where gravity is important, so again, to the, away from the orbital point. But then, because I still have eight supersymmetries in this particular case, I could still have an integrable structure, even if I have gra even if gravity is important. On the other hand, if I increase temperature, clearly I'm going to mess up all this stuff. So there are two ways um, to approach a chaotic system. Do you approach it in both, or do you expect it to appear in both examples, or just in one? Or? I think the intuition is that if in the dual gravitational description you have a, a black hole in Einstein gravity, that you should saturate a chaos bound. No, but this would be at t equals zero, right? 
Um, Actually, the two yeah, so you would need, yes, if you have a macroscopic, so you need an actual black hole, right? So some macroscopic horizon. That is this is, in a sense, a two-charge system, so it doesn't have a black hole. So in a sense, you, know, you could still have this non chaotic behavior when you're in gravity, and you have to do it in a three-charge system to see the black hole and to see the chaotic behavior. Yeah, so in the three-charge system at strong coupling, you should definitely have the chaotic behavior, like whether in some intermediate things where you don't end up with, uh, with, with the macroscopic. Uh, S Y K is supposed to be T equal zero. So this yeah. So I think the it's disordered. It's disordered by hand. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, but there are there are relatively direct uh, arguments for this out of time order four point function. How it gets translated to some uh, scattering event, which would typically happen near the horizon, and that's how this uh, universal Lyapunov exponent comes in. So. Even if it's an extremal horizon. Okay, right, but... Yeah, it's an extremal horizon, it's very different. Yeah, okay, right, so, okay, I don't know. We, intuitively, I kind of expect that um, a supersymmetric zero temperature thing would have a more rational spectrum rather than the kind of spectrum you're talking about there. So I'd expect something more like what you're showing here, but that's just a guess. It actually depends. If you have a superstratum of funny shape, you know, you can have a more smooth spectrum on the planet. I mean, you know. And here, I mean, you know, the typical state in the bulk would be some super tube of like, you know, completely weird shape, and, you know, in principle, it could have any spectrum you want. Uh, the chaos that is being discussed here, it's, it appears to be more molecular chaos, a microscopic number of degrees of freedom, rather than deterministic chaos that would be associated, that is associated to butterfly effects and uh, typical So, uh, for instance, this is an extremal black hole. If in the extremal limit, even if you are uh, chaotic, and there, uh, would, would, it be, would it be possible in this, with this technology to probe whether a microscopic number of degrees of freedom are contributing to the processes here, or rather, a uh, small number of degrees of freedom, like what's happening in the Chernobyl case, are in fact contributing. Because, for instance, uh, the, when you're talking about Lorentz attractor, they are fluid; it has a microscopic number of degrees of freedom, but only three of them contribute to the dynamics of interest. Is can, can something similar be seen here in some approximation? Well, I don't know the. Well, the model for which we did specific computations was in a non-chaotic regime, right? So um, it's, yeah, I don't know. I don't immediately know what would be the result if we were able to push it to the... Well, could it have, if there are, say, N1 D1 brains and 5 D5 brains, and eventually the third charge comes... It, it, but when these take microscopic values, nevertheless, a subset of each contributes to the degeneracies of the final... I don't know. I mean, I would expect in a very strongly coupled regime that is maybe not so obvious to keep track of this in the field theory. So I think the simplest description in that case would be the gravitational one, presumably. But uh, Maybe one last question. Like, the, uh, the fact that you have to average over time and you cannot average or, or over the microstate, is that due to the fact that you are at zero coupling, essentially, in the orbital point? Or do you think it's going to go... No, that's because one has a fixed Hamiltonian. So uh, as as soon as your spectrum of energy eigenvalues is fixed, which it is for a given Hamiltonian, then all these phase factors will be fixed. And all you would change by going to a different state is the factors that multiply these uh, phase factors. But if these phase factors at late time start acting as random phases, it doesn't matter what you multiply them with. But then what is the physical interpretation of that? Because it's a time, it's a, it's a coarse graining in time. Uh, so I, d I don't it just you you get this erratic behavior and you look for some way of getting out of this uh, erratic thing some smooth curve that you of which you can then study try to study the, the properties either numerically or maybe even analytically so this is a a proposal for what one can do when one is presented with uh, some erratically oscillating curve like that and, and how to get something smooth uh, out of it um, it's maybe it's very short so, as you said in the beginning, 
The puzzle since Maldicena's paper has been that in a black hole background, the two-point function keeps decaying, whereas in any quantum system it wiggles. So if one were to take one of these microstates, like the ones discussed in the previous talk, and compute the two-point function, what would it look like at like times? Wiggle. That's a question for Yosif, I guess. It wiggles, it just goes in and then spends some time, gets out, and then spends more time, gets out. So, you know, it's, you know if, you do, if you look at the geodesic, you know, you have many geodesics. No, no, that's it, that's it, the two-point function. I just want to plot of the two-point function at late times. Does it keep decaying exponentially? Does it no, 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 it wiggles, it wiggles. But does it but does it wiggle in this erratic way? With uh, I mean that would be surprising to get that from some cl from some classical gravity background. It would be very surprising to have these erratic oscillations at late times. No, because the mass gap on it. So if you ask what's energy, what's the spectrum of energy above it? You know, let's suppose you have a two charge system and you have a super tube which has an arbitrary shape. An arbitrary shape. If you do a billiard in an arbitrary shape, is going to be an erratic system. It will not be regular at all. So if it's a, okay. if it's an arbitrary shaped super tube, which is going to be the typical state in our system, if you look at a billiard, for example, in the system, and you look at you know, for example, minimal paths, and you know, you look at all the saddle points, uh, they all be erratic. There's no regularity in them. Only very few states, very very few states are regular. Okay. Generally, it would be very well, regular. Would, like, but this would be very interesting to see a plot in these microstates and compare that with the plot in random matrix there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I propose we continue over the break after Frank's talk to keep so let's thank Ben. Okay.